This is Premier Dynamics podcast number 41. And today we're talking about the static pressure, dynamic pressure, and the total pressure, also known as the stagnation pressure. We're talking about what these are, what the relationships are between them, and how they're useful for aerodynamics in general, but also in wind tunnel experiments in particular. So this is a video that I'm showing. This is a clip from a larger video that shows an object in the wind tunnel. And you have some tufts on there these little uh, lines, these strings, and when they're moving, the wind is on. When they uh, fall down, the wind is off. And this object here shows these different pressures. So you have the flat plate at the front, and we'll discuss what all these pressures mean and how you can determine what these pressures are from this simple experiment. We also have another experiment, another example, some CFD, that will highlight this more. So let's talk about what these different pressures are. Let's start with the dynamic pressure first. So looking at Let's go to some equations because they're a bit easier to understand because we've seen them a lot. So the top line here, we have the pressure dynamic. So P dynamic equals half times rho times V squared. So half times the density times the velocity squared. And we see this in a lot of different other equations. For example, the drag coefficient or lift coefficient equations, you'll find this in. And what this is, is how much the pressure is in the flow. So when the flow is not moving, you can see that the velocity is zero. So zero meters per second, zero kilometers per hour, zero miles per hour, zero feet per second, whatever units you're using. So the pressure, the dynamic pressure is going to be zero. But why is the dynamic pressure so important? First of all, when we use wind tunnels, we often use the dynamic pressure to determine what the velocity of the flow is. So if you've ever heard of something called a pitostatic tube, this is uh, simply just a tube with a hole in the front and then holes around the side. And what these holes do is that they measure the total pressure and the static pressure. And then from that, we can determine what the dynamic pressure is, which we'll get to a little bit later in the podcast. Let's just focus on dynamic pressure first. And what we can find is if we know what the dynamic pressure is, we can then just rearrange this equation where we put the half and the row on the other side, we square root it, and then we'll get the velocity. So the dynamic pressure is very important from a wind engineering point of view when you want to find out what the velocity of your flow is. But I've also written another equation and the kinetic energy equation. And the reason why I've written this is because when you put them side by side, you see a lot of similarities between the two. And you don't actually see this in really any textbook. I've never seen it. I haven't seen it in any lecture. Um, I just kind of stumbled upon it because... Um, Kinetic energy was always one of my favorite equations for some reason. I don't know why. I just saw a lot of similarities. And if you look at both of them, you can see, okay, they both have half in there. They have, both have V squared in there. And one has mass, but the other one has density. And the density is related to the mass. It's just the mass divided by the volume. So the difference between the dynamic pressure and the kinetic energy is just the volume. If you were to time the dynamic pressure by volume, you would get the kinetic energy. So what does this mean? It means if you have a flow, if you have, let's say, one meter cubed of air moving at a certain velocity, you can then figure out how much energy that it, that has just by simply knowing the volume of it. We know the density is going to be 1.2 kilograms per meter cubed approximately. Uh, it can change a little bit depending on the pressure, temperature, and uh, the barometric pressure, sorry, temperature and humidity. But it's going to be around 1.2, 1.225, maybe 1.18 kilograms per meter cubed. So we know what the density is, we know the volume is of the air, and we also know what the velocity is of this air moving. So we have everything we need to figure out the kinetic energy. So what this means is we can then determine how much kinetic energy this flow has. And that's something very important because then we can figure out, okay, well, how can we, how much energy can we extract from the flow? How much energy do we have left if this flow is hitting a surface? And it's just a very important parameter. Yeah, really, um, we understand a lot more about um, our flow if we think of the dynamic pressure as related to the kinetic energy. So that's one pressure, dynamic pressure. The other pressure that we have is the static pressure, which is here. And this is just a simple equation. It's um, just the, the pressure alone. And what is the static pressure? So the static pressure is the 
ambient pressure. If you have still, if you have air and you're moving with the air, so this is an important um, distinction. I was going to say still air, and if you um, took note, I stopped myself before I said that because that's not entirely accurate. The more accurate way of thinking about static pressure is if you're moving with the air, because everything is relative. It depends on your frame of reference. When we're walking around outside, or just let's say we're standing outside and there's no wind, the air to us is moving at the same velocity as we are, which is zero meters per second. So there's no relative movement between the two. And this is important because that means we're moving with the flow or the flow is moving with us, whichever one you want to think about. And that is the static pressure. What pressure you're feeling when you're not, when there's no relative movement between you and the flow. And on a regular day, we call this the barometric pressure. That's the same thing. It's 101,300 um, pascals. That is the standard pressure, but again, it fluctuates from about 98,000 to 103,000 is um, a general range. And we often just call this gauge, which means we reference everything to this barometric pressure. Now, the reason why this is important for wind tunnels is for a couple of reasons. Yeah. One is that the pressure inside a wind tunnel, particularly a closed loop wind tunnel, is usually higher, the static pressure, than outside. The reason why is because you have a fan that's pushing all this air and it's um, creating this pressure. It's moved, trying to move it forward. So it's not uncommon for the static pressure inside a wind tunnel to be different to the static pressure inside the room that the wind tunnel is in. And this is usually... It, the values will depend on the velocity that you are running your wind tunnel at, but a general um, range will be about 10 to 50 pascals difference. So inside the wind tunnel will be about, particularly the, the um, test section, it will be about 10 to 50 pascals higher than outside. So it's not that much, but it is just something to keep in mind. If you are trying to measure the static pressure of your flow, it's best to put the tube inside your wind tunnel particularly inside the test section in, in the um, general area of your object, because in the contraction, it is a little bit different. Again, the test section is what you're interested in. The static pressure we can conclude is the pressure of the air when there's no relative movement between you and the air. So that is an important point. The next equation that we want to look at is the total pressure or the, st the stagnation pressure. And the stagnation pressure is a little bit more descriptive than the total pressure. From the stagnation pressure, you can kind of figure out what it means. It's when the flow is stagnating. And what is this? So when you have a flow moving and it hits an object, often there'll be a point, theoretically there's one point where, at, at least one point, where the flow is hitting and it comes to a complete stop. That means the flow has stagnated. So all this uh, pressure, which is coming from the dynamic pressure, is being dumped into um, the surface and it's increasing the pressure on this surface. So you not only have the static pressure acting on this surface, it's also the dynamic pressure, uh, which is being converted because it's coming to zero and to zero meters per second, and that's being converted into the total pressure. And this is where we come back to the kinetic energy idea, where if you have a high dynamic pressure, it means that the flow has more energy generally uh, because it's uh, high velocity. So that means it's dumping more energy into this object. So we can figure out how much energy is going into the object, how much energy we have left with all these different pressures. But one other reason why this is important is the total pressure we use when we're determining what the velocity of our wind tunnel is. Again, total pressure, static pressure, and dynamic pressure we're all using. We want to determine what the velocity of our wind tunnel is. There's another method where you can have two points in your contraction and then you have a calibration curve to, based on the pressures at those two points. But that's um, not nearly as frequently used as this pressure, this um, method where we measure the pressures with a pedostatic tube and then we determine what the dynamic pressure is and then we determine what the velocity is through rearranging the dynamic pressure equation. So, how do we do that? Coming back to the pedostatic tube we have the hole in the front and that measures the total pressure. Why is that? Because it's at the front and then the flow is coming at the front and it's hitting and it's stagnating. So all the static pressure and dynamic pressure are being grouped together and we can determine what the total pressure is from that. So that's one part of the equation. Now, 
with the static pressure, we measure that with the pitostatic tube as well with the static holes. So the static holes are the holes around the outside. They're usually three or four, maybe even five um, or more uh, tube widths downstream from the front hole. And these measure the static pressure. The reason why is because the idea is that no flow is going to be going into the uh, those holes. So you're not going to be having any of the dynamic pressure corrupting the static pressure measurement. So you can measure the static pressure with these holes. So once we know what the, the total pressure is, the static pressure from these two different types of holes, we can then rearrange this equation to find the dynamic pressure, which is simply just the difference between the two pressures that we're measuring. Once we find the dynamic pressure, we can then rearrange the dynamic pressure equation and find the velocity. So that's what we use it for wind tunnel engineering. And when we want to make sure that whatever research we're doing, we're making sure that we're having the right velocity. And this is also important for CFD because with CFD, we want to make sure whatever velocity we have in the wind tunnel, we want to use it with CFD as well so we can validate our CFD. If we have our velocities are different, then we're not going to be validating our CFD properly. The run is going to be different and everything. The velocity is very important. The, this video that I'm showing now, this is a CFD simulation of an egg. I just did an egg because it's a very simple shape and it shows us what we want to see. So we have the flow going from um, upstream to downstream. And at the front, you can see this red. So the egg is colored in the pressure distribution on the surface. And the reason why we see this red, it means that it's a higher pressure. And this red indicates that we are seeing this stagnation region. So the, the point where it's most red, that means that's the stagnation point and that's where the total pressure is occurring. And what this point means is that we have not only the static pressure acting on the egg, we also have the dynamic pressure acting on the egg where this point um, is not, is having all this flow crash into it and it's coming to a halt, completely zero meters per second. All that energy, is being transferred into a surface pressure. And so that's why we get this high pressure at the front. And this happens with every object. The original video that I showed you in this in the start of this podcast with that half sphere, the front is a flat plate. And a lot of that flat plate is going to be experiencing a very high pressure on its surface. The reason why is because most of the flow that's hitting that surface is going to be coming either to a complete uh, halt or very close to a complete halt. So it's dumping all that energy into the total pressure. And that's why we're getting this high pressure. So that's what the dynamic pressure is, static pressure and total pressure is. I'll just recover, um, recap what each one of these three are. The first is static pressure. This is the pressure that you're feeling, the object is feeling when there's no relative movement between the flow and itself. The dynamic pressure is the pressure that's coming from the movement of the flow. So how much velocity this flow has. When there's a relative movement between you and the flow, you're going to be experiencing not only the static pressure, but also the dynamic pressure. And at the limiting case, where the dynamic pressure, um, where the velocity of the flow comes to complete halt on you. So if, if you look at the flow away from you, it's moving relative to you, but the flow that's hitting you is now not moving at all, so it's stagnating, then that results in the total pressure that you're feeling on yourself or on the object itself, like that egg that I showed. And coming back to this idea of the, the density. So remember at the um, early in the podcast, I said that if you know what the velocity of the air that you have is, the volume and the density, you can then figure out what the kinetic energy is. So the density I said changes. It depends on the barometric pressure temperature and humidity on whatever day that you're doing your experiments or your research on. To get around that, uh, we have developed a instrument called the Atmosphere Hawk that accurately measures the barometric pressure, temperature, and humidity for you. So you, you can then calculate very accurately the density of your air so you can get that right. If you don't calculate this value properly, you can see that the velocity that you will calculate from your dynamic pressure for your wind tunnel is going to be different now because the density is, is wrong. And then when you try to use that in your CFD to validate it, that's going to be wrong too. If you want to use um, these values for other measurements, such as calculating what the, the drag coefficient or whatever is, then that's going to be wrong too. 
and then the reynolds number is also going to be wrong as well so this instrument that we make that gets rid of that error we also make other instruments we make traverses we make PRV systems we also do courses so we have cfd theory like this so if you want to learn more theory you can learn it there we also do experiments and we also do the international Arts conference links in the description this is the end of this podcast make sure to like subscribe and i'll see you in the next podcast peace out